John McMullen joins us now on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Uh, it's been a crazy week, John, as uh, the Eagles obviously, uh, their backs are to the wall. Uh, there's Doug Peterson. I know he was on a conference call with the New York media and actually, you know, admit it, not that it's as crazy, but they got to cheer for the Dallas Cowboys. He kind of kind of threw that out there like, hey, when we put ourselves in this position, yep, our fans need to suck it up and root for the Cowboys. Uh, do you sense a little bit of, I don't want to say desperation, but do they kind of have that feeling of, we know what this Sunday means to our season? Yeah, there's no question. Uh, this is a team that needs to turn it around, uh, and they need to turn it around uh, this Sunday against the Giants. If they lose this game, because remember, Dallas obviously plays Washington. It would be better, as you mentioned, uh, if the Cowboys win that football game from an Eagles perspective. But one of those two teams is going to win. So if the Eagles don't handle their business, uh, especially if Washington wins, but even if Dallas wins, that's going to cook them as far as really competing in this division. So I, I think the next two weeks will tell us all we need to know about whether the last four games are going to be meaningful or not. Um, you know, this Giants team, the Eagles scored 30 on them. They haven't scored 30 against anybody else the entire season. They scored 39 times last year. So when they played this Giants team, we were debating that they were one of the worst teams in the league. They were in the ugly five. We just took them out of the ugly five before you came on. They're turning it around. How, how bad of a loss would this be if you're at the point of your season where they have progressed more than you have? Well, I, yeah, I, I think it would be a, a, a terrible loss from the perspective of, of I think everybody understands uh, the Giants aren't ready to compete right now, but they have been improving incrementally. So if you start going uh, in clearly the opposite direction, uh, it's going to be viewed as a disappointment. But as I always tell you, Mike, in this league, you can talk yourself into things. And I get a sense that everybody's looking at this landscape. And remember, since that game, really, uh, the Giants have, have sort of turned the offense over more to Saquon Barkley. Uh, they become more of a, a 12 personnel team or even uh, two backs with Red, Red Ellison as a lead blocker. Uh, and they're trying to run the football and do things that way. They have Evan Ingram back who didn't play in the first game. So if you look at Barkley and Ingram and Odell Beckham and, and Sterling Shepard, <laughs> you can talk yourself into the fact that the Giants got a lot of weapons. And if you have to throw out, again, the Cravon LeBlancs of the world and Chandon Sullivan, I, I don't know how you persevere. I really well, let me don't. ask you. Let me ask you on that real quick. I know uh, Douglas did not participate. Sidney Jones did not participate. Avante Maddox, Jalen Mills. Are we going to see Cravon LeBlanc, uh, Chandon Sullivan, Trey Sullivan, Devonte Bosby? Yeah, I mean, right now yeah, they're not at practice. So at, at some point, yeah, I, I think the hope was that Jalen Mills could get back on the field. Uh, that's looking less and less likely till he can actually uh, practice. It's clear that Doug is holding out hope. Uh, he said Avante Maddox and Rasul Douglas would do some little things as far as movement to see how far along they are. But I, I tell you, if you look at that Maddox injury, I, I would be stunned if he's able to play uh, this weekend. Uh, Rasul... It, it, you know, he's labeled him as day-to-day, -day, but it also looked somewhat significant. This team is in dire straits at corner, and you can't just go down to the dollar store and pick up corners, as we've all seen. So if that, if, if the worst-case scenario uh, develops and this week continues on and nobody's practicing, the Eagles are in a whole heap of trouble. John, we were having a conversation earlier, and, and I thought you would be one of the perfect people to bring this up with. It was 
Ryan and I having the conversation about the reaction with Mike Rose comments that we talked about with you yesterday, and it's centered around is Doug Peterson relying on Mike Rowe too much, or is is Doug Peterson simply ignoring Mike Rowe like he's not even there? And I contend that if it were the case in which Doug Peterson was ignoring everything that Mike Rowe was doing and, and basically downplaying the fact that he had an offensive coordinator, that would have come out similarly to the statement that Mike Rowe made that kind of opened up the door for criticism. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I, I wrote last week about Mike Rowe getting set up as a scapegoat. And I, I thought, you know, people started jumping on the dog pile on the rabbit yesterday because of what he said about not, you know, it being challenging about getting gold paid on the field. I, I, I you know, I find it difficult to criticize people for taking accountability. And that's what Mike kind of did. So whether it's Doug Peterson, whether it's Mike Rowe, whether it's a combination of both, uh, each deserves blame for not being able to get a guy you spent a third-round pick on and, and made clear as a playmaker to get him involved in the offense. Everybody deserves uh, a piece of that pie. But if you want to boil it down even further than that, that's where it comes to me. I just don't think Mike Groh's a good offensive coordinator. Uh, and I think they've taken a big hit in that uh, in that particular position from Frank Reich. That's self-evident. I, I don't know how anybody could make that argument. But, and Mike can tell you, I've been making that argument since the summer that this was going to happen. And I think people who were brushing it off, saying it's not a big deal, they are wrong. And, and they're being proven wrong right now. Can I can I just interject real quick, uh, the Mike Gross stuff? How did it take until you finally stepped up and asked about it today? <laughs> uh, well, Mike was yesterday. You, you're talking about asking Doug about going. Right. I mean, Tuesday, Gross, I would figure the first question that Peterson would get is, hey, your offensive coordinator came out and said, you guys are having a hard time interjecting golden tape that you gave a third round pick would you concur with that i mean i give you credit that you finally were the guy that did it but how did it take so long well it, it, there was another big issue and i apologize there's evidently a hurricane coming in uh the Novacare complex right now but uh you know malcolm jenkins also had his book so you could go either direction uh, as far as what you wanted to tackle first. And then you always have to do the injuries as well because Doug doesn't volunteer that information. But, yeah, he was not happy when I asked the question. Uh, and, and it was pretty evident. And I, I, I don't understand why. He knew it was coming. Uh, you got to understand it's coming. And this team has done a bad job. And I think You've seen the surliness at times this year, and that's born out of frustration because they're not having success. Jim Schwartz yesterday would answer questions, you know, how do you think you're doing four and six? That's where the Eagles are. The Eagles are four and six, and they're a disappointing football team, and everybody's getting their back up a little bit. And I, and I think that's natural. That's what tends to happen. That's why, I mean, just to go on with what you were saying, I mean, Aton, we were talking about, all right, who's number one to blame? And he said, oh, it's Mike Rowe. It's not even, and I'm not here to argue against that because it's very valid, but my line of thinking, John, was Doug's the guy. Like, like Doug is the captain of the ship, so if he sees Mike Rowe struggling, he needs to step in and grab some responsibility items off his table and if it's the opposite then he needs to give some back or like it, it falls on Doug being a leader noticing his guy struggling or something not working and to me it just seems like because of the continuous losses that he's not doing that yeah I mean yeah I think you have to be fair it, and the buck stops offensively on this team with Doug Peterson and defensively Jim Schwartz so if you're going to criticize somebody uh, for offensive issues, you have to criticize Doug Peterson. And that includes hiring Pike Grove, because I think yeah. if there's an issue there, he probably made the wrong decision uh, as far as the guy to promote. 
So it all comes back to Doug Peterson at one point or another, uh, and he, he knows that. He understands it, and that's part of being an offensive head coach. This is his offense. This is his offense when Frank Reich was here. Uh, this is his offense with Mike Groh. Uh, from that standpoint, nothing has changed. He's the play caller. He's the guy with the final decision. He's the guy who, who scripts those first 15 plays uh, that aren't working week in and week out. So, yeah, it's, it, it's definitely Doug Peterson before Mike Groh. Yeah, and, you know, we've been talking a lot about the secondary, rightfully so, completely banged up. But I want your take on this. I mean, one thing the Eagles were doing well for a while was their rush defense. They were fourth in the league, and then insert the game against the Cowboys, and then the following week against the Saints. Back-to-back -back weeks, 170 rushing yards given up or more on the ground. And here comes Saquon Barkley, like you mentioned earlier. So... What should we expect from this Eagles run defense, uh, figuring out how to stop down really the head of the snake in Saquon Barkley? Well, you're right from a, a, a statistical standpoint, the run game, the gym has kind of harped on that. The run defense hasn't been there over the past two weeks. I think some of that is just an uptick in talent. Uh, you're talking about Ezekiel Elliott. You're talking about Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara. Those are pretty good backs, and, and yeah. well, you have a pretty good back as well this week. So, But to me, if I'm the New York Giants, and I say, well, Tim Jernigan's back. Now, I, I don't know how much he's going to play uh, after missing the first 10 games and not having an offseason, uh, but he is a good player. Uh, that front four is still pretty stout as a whole. You don't have Jordan Hicks. So that enters the equation as well. But I go back to LeBlanc, uh, Sullivan, and Boss. If they're out there, you you got to seriously think if you're Pat Shermer, the easier way to go is to take advantage of those guys. So he kind of has to ask the question, do I trust Eli Manning? Just the weakness, even though they haven't stopped the run, and that's fair to say, over the past two weeks, the weakness on this Eagles defense is pretty clear cut. Yeah. John, let me ask you this question in, in response to what you were saying to Ryan about the Bucks stopping at Doug Peterson. And I get it. I'm not here to argue the hierarchy by any means of control and order. But to your response, what exactly does Mike Rowe do? <laughs> well, Mike Rowe, it, it, in theory, takes over Frank's shit. Frank Reich's job, uh, which is helping in game planning. Uh, when you're a head coach, obviously you have a lot of issues that don't deal with football. Right. Uh, a lot of ancillary things from everything from dealing with the media uh, to dealing with uh, maybe player uh, based issues. It, it's a time consuming job. So there are offensive head coaches in this league who have offensive coordinators. Pat Shermer talked about that today. He used to be the offensive coordinator here under Chip Kelly. Uh, you still have an important job when it comes to game planning. In the case of how the Eagles were split it up last year, uh, uh, it, it was Frank Reich had a big impact on third down. Sean DiFilippo had a big impact on red zone. And in theory, they keep saying they haven't changed that. So Mike Rowe and Press Taylor are theoretically involved but I always point out, you know, look at it as if you're a script writer and you have your sort of assistant, everything gets run by you. Uh, and if you don't like something, you can exit out and put it in. And that's, that's the power that Doug Peterson has. It's the power he utilized last year. It's the power he's utilizing this year as well. So, I, I, I mean... Yeah, an offensive coordinator under an offensive head coach does not have the same kind of power as an offensive coordinator that calls plays. That's one of the reasons John DiFilippo isn't here, because yeah, he wanted we, to go somewhere where he could call plays. Doesn't aren't we having our cake, John? Important. Aren't we having our cake and eating it too by saying Frank Reich and John DiFilippo were everything to Doug Peterson last year, and now... 
removing, and I'm not saying you specifically are doing this, but it seems like the conversation is moving away from scapegoating or pinning that same responsibility in a negative sense on Mike Rowe. It's almost like when things were working well, it was a team effort, and now that things have gone to you know what, it's Doug, Doug, Doug. No, I, no, because I just, you know, when I said it's Doug, 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 I also said I don't think Mike Rowe is a very good offensive coordinator. <laughs> you I, did. I I, you did. Right. Yeah. I, I don't think he, he's doing near the same job as Frank Wright did as far as funneling ideas and, and play calls and thoughts and, and scheme. Uh, I, I don't think he's helping the same way. And I think that's pretty evident as well. Uh, I also think it's pretty natural. Uh, if you look at a guy taking on that position, now he was an offense coordinator back in college, uh, but that's a whole different ball game, and that was years ago. And I just go back. Obviously, more uh, head coach is a more high-profile position, so we see it. And you saw some of the rookie mistakes Doug Peterson made his first year here, uh, and he got better, uh, and he got better, and he got better. And that's what you hope. You hope you hire somebody. There's always going to be a learning curve. You're always going to learn on the job. And you hope he gets better. I, I, have I seen any evidence of him getting better to this point? Not necessarily. But, again, that's the hope. Yeah. Hey, uh, would a win on Sunday be enough evidence? I know it's suggest how do they do it. But they beat the Giants pretty handily the last time, and we thought – would a win on Sunday against the Giants uh, be enough evidence to suggest that they can get back in this race, or have you seen enough to already suggest no, win I, or I lose, I know the, the answer? Giants, I think if they beat the Giants, they're back in the race because then you have the Redskins coming in without their quarterback, uh, and, and then you're off and running. As I said, if the Cowboys beat the Redskins, what we expect them to do uh, with no Alex Smith and Colt McCoy playing quarterback. Then the Saints play the Cowboys. you got to expect the Cowboys to lose that game. All of a sudden, the Eagles are tied for first place, heading into Dallas, and then you sort of roll the dice. That's what you want. That's the best-case scenario. Uh, and, you know, to me, the issue remains, can you win a football game if you have to play – LeBlanc and Sullivan and Balls be a cornerback. <laughs> if they're able to beat the New York Giants with those three guys playing corner, <laughs> I, well, I think nobody, I think we should create a rule that nobody should ever criticize Jim Sports again. I know nobody's going uh, uh, to agree it. to that. <laughs> but I, I don't know how you win a game with those three guys. So I, I've said it all week. It's very important to look at Bills, Douglas, Maddox, as this week goes on, because they're not great by any stretch of the imagination, any of them, but they're NFL players, and it's a big difference when they're out there. Yeah, John, I mean, you just brought it up again. I'm just curious your take on it. You you said it with me that Shermer, it's, it, he'd be silly not to try and exploit those guys in the secondary, but then you have Saquon Barkley in the backfield. If you had to predict uh, what the Giants are going to do, I mean, it, is it obvious they're just going to try and air it out and trust Eli, or it's not that obvious because who knows who Eli really is right now? It looks like he's not who he used to be. Are they going to try and pound yeah, it out on the ground? I, 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 I do think he's going to lean more on Saquon Barkley because, A, two things, that's more conservative, number one. Yeah. Uh, and, and secondly, as you've seen him at times uh, on the sidelines, you can just look up the YouTube clips. He, he knows Eli Manning can't play, and he's shown his frustration. Uh, and, and he's mouthed it on the sidelines, and he, he's done it time and time again. So, you know, I think the average coach would fall into that trap and see those names. I keep mentioning uh, LeBlanc and, and, and Sullivan. And ba ba I think LeBlanc and will go down as the greatest. The trap. The, the LeBlanc will go down as the greatest, like, Back up. Scrub Eagle ever. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, it's not his fault. And, no. and it's easy to pick on him because of his name. And I've made <laughs> wine jokes and liqueur jokes and everything else in between. Uh, but, it, it, you know, as a head coach. Will he get better with age? <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. 
Thank and, you. And, <laughs> as a head coach, as an offensive head coach, to me it would be very difficult not to try to exploit that. But I think Pat Shermer is smart enough. Right. And as I said, he's shown enough frustration in his quarterback to know that he doesn't have the quarterback right now. So he'll, I think he'll lean on Saquon Barkley. Now, that said, he'll take some shots with Odell yeah. Beckham because Eli's not a cripple. I, I mean, if Odell's open, you know, running 10 yards past the corner, he could still hit him. Uh, but I don't know if that's their best way to win, at least on a consistent basis. Uh, John McMullen, 97.3 ESPN.com. Uh, all right, I know it's early. I know we're still a little, uh, couple days away here, but you got to give us a pick. <laughs> Boy, I haven't even thought about picking this game, but, uh, you know, as we sit here on Wednesday and everything sort of, if you look into it, is the fact that Mills and Maddox and Douglas aren't going to be able to go. And if they're not going to be able to go, I, I you know, I, I want to hold on to my right to change this prediction because it changes if they play. But if they don't play, I'm picking the Giants to win this game. I don't know Ooh, how you win. Rock bottom. With man. those corners. Just think about when we, per, when we, when we were uh, previewing this game a couple of weeks ago, and, and, and you know, it was almost ridiculous to, per, to presume that the, the Giants could win this game. Yeah, and I, it, it's a special circumstance because I can't come up with another year. I'm sure it's happened before. Yeah. But I, I can't think of another year where a team has lost its top five cornerback and no, you're down nuts. to six, seven, and eight. Um, real I, quick, John. It, it just doesn't happen. Uh, John McMullen, 97.3 ESPN.com here on the Sports Bash. Uh, real quick, who wins, Dallas or Washington? Uh, I think Dallas wins. I, I, you know, Washington without Alex Smith uh, on the road. Uh, so that shapes up as very difficult. And that's the positive. That's the frustrating part because I think Washington is ultimately coming back to the pack. And if the Eagles were healthy, they'd be able to beat the Giants. They'd be able to beat the Redskins next week. And they'd be right back in this thing. But they're they're just not healthy. John McMullen, 97.3 ESPN.com here on the Boardwalk on the Hotline. All right, John, happy Thanksgiving to you, pal. Uh, you too, guys. Happy Thanksgiving.